Welcome to Questions We're Afraid to Ask. All right, we are back with OJ again, just because I wanted to keep talking to you about ancient civilizations. And so we talked, and you you talked about a bunch of stuff that I was not familiar with. So I've now gone and read, like, four books. Um, so I read <laughs> – uh, I read – Oh, what's it called again? It's Stages of Time, or is that their new one? I read Matt Lacroix's book. Um, yeah, I'm familiar with the him. New one, I, no, yeah, though this Stage of Time is the one that he that he wrote. He's got a new one coming out with uh, with Billy Carson here. Let's let's talk about this oh. real quick. Billy, Love Billy Billy is a is a weird guy for me. Um, yeah, me too. And Bill Bill has put it the best I can. I get used car salesman vibes from Billy. Yeah. Like, or okay. okay. Or um, televangelist, like sleazy televangelist vibes, the same kind of thing. And yeah, yeah it's – I don't know what it is. And we were talking about it, and I was like, I, I don't know if it's the suit, just the way he puts his, himself off, the way he talks or whatever. And it, it, it doesn't mean anything yeah. bad about him. It's just like that initial, wait a minute. You know, I was warned about people like – you know, it's just that, that, <laughs> you know. that radar is going off. I I can't help but to think the same thing, and that's my initial gut reaction. And your intuition, you know, you got to listen to it because we're finding mm-hmm. more and more that that's kind of where where a lot of this lies. But you know what's fascinating, and I was just telling my wife this, is that uh, he's crossed paths with another guy that's uh, named Robert Edward Grant, and he's almost like my spirit animal because. He he's wrote he he he's written a book called Philomath, which I highly recommend. I wanted to touch more on it. I didn't get a chance to really dive it, uh, take a deep dive in the kind of the uh, geometry, the sacred geometry, and the pyramids, and all this stuff that he talks about with mm-hmm. uh, with just the because of their own covering. I think as we speak, two more pyramids that are about uh, I think ten kilometers north of the. He's a plateau, which those two pyramids would actually complete all, I believe, eight or 12 octaves of the musical geometric component spectrum, which is, which is interesting. Well, well, I say all that to say that Robert Edward Grant and a couple of other guys uh, that, that I really uh, are, are respectable and, and, and have gone through the academia realm – um, are going out on, on this mission. And uh, there's another one. Uh, are you familiar with uh, Donald uh, Hoffman? Uh, which that is one another... sounds really familiar. Don- I recognize yeah, the Donald, Robert Edward Donald... Grant guy. I've seen him before. I do too. Oh, yeah, Donald Robert... Hoffman wrote Case Against Reality, which is a spectacular read. So, so you mentioned something real quick that I just want to mention before we dive into all the details. <clears throat> The, the the finding more pyramids in on the Giza plateau and let's just I just want to acknowledge this for a moment. There is mm-hmm. so much shit buried under the stand under the sand. All of them potentially what well, regardless mm-hmm. of what we're going to call them, right? There is so much shit buried under the sand that we yeah. don't know where it is. There's so much shit buried under the Amazon rainforest right now. We're finding with lidar. There's just there's so much well, there's so much shit they're finding under the water. Right. There's just so much out oh, there yeah. that regardless of the theories, we we have to admit now that what we knew is what we know is wrong and incomplete. And then you, you may not have had a chance to listen to it, but we just interviewed the director of the Galt site up here in Florence, which is one of the famous archaeological paradigm shattering um, sites for mm. Clovis, Clovis first. Because it pushes it pushes the stone points and stuff way past the the Clovis line, you know, to twenty thousand yeah, years to six, potentially sixteen at least well, sixteen oh, yeah. to twenty, and then they hit bedrock, so it could potentially and go that's in, and than that's that. in Texas, so that's, that's just right up the road, middle of North America, oh. you know, yeah. sixteen thousand years ago, which just breaks the whole Clovis first, the whole you know land so, bridge idea, and and even got that it, is it. still taking time to like change the textbooks and stuff like. There are still there are still people who are like no 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 Clovis first we don't care that other crap that you found underneath it but it's there so all of this is going on and I say all that just to say that regardless of what the theories are 
we got to know there's more there. And kind of that's where I'm coming from because I haven't got Absolutely. a chance to read a lot of yeah. the books and stuff that Dan Daniel has. But it's just like, let's just admit yeah. whether we're right or wrong about what's happening, there's stuff, right? I mean, yeah. there's stuff. Yeah. So that's it's that's my it's thing. interesting when you start to shift the when you start to adjust the timeline, mm -hmm. um, and you start to realize that like. Oh, if I if I take this timeline and I stretch it and I put a break in the middle, then all of a sudden all of these things start to fall into place and you go like, oh, OK, there was a thing and then a flood and then all this other stuff happened and then the cataclysm happened and it just was a big eraser. And then mm -hmm. we pick up all of a sudden with, you know, everything popping up at one time in Sumer when they have math and time and science and politics and agriculture and it all just springs forth out of nowhere um and what's so cool about we, that we have to be willing to admit <clears throat> that and it's it's longer and we've we've made a mistake and, and what's yeah. really cool about that specifically at the, at the galt site because we have looked at it some about what's online and stuff but he shared with us they didn't just find stone stuff and a little bit of pottery here they found art twenty thousand year old art it's it's amazing. And, he sent me a picture of it. Yeah, and um, it's, it's 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 not like wow Michelangelo, but yeah. it's definitively it's this, art. It's a piece yes. of stone, and then it's just, I mean it, they call it wheat because that's probably the closest thing. But it's it's very clearly like a couple of stalks of some plant with with flowers on top, and you're like, okay, that's that's sixteen thousand years ago. That's that's clearly we were doing something here, and know? that also <laughs> means that yeah. at a basic caloric level. They had time to doodle into rock. This is not to carve into stone is not easy. It's not like doodling on a piece of paper, right? They had time to sit and enjoy their day and carve into stone. Well, and, that is that you know, is the case for even yeah. modern hunter gatherers that they only oh, end absolutely. up they they only end up working on on most days i think they said it's about 4 hours yeah. and then they kind of they gather what they need unless a big hunt happens and they have to you know but right, like, yeah right. they they have so, a much more relaxed <laughs> lifestyle than we do but it's it's very interesting when you start to go back and look at this stuff cuz i went back and read because you, you kept talking about the tablets of of thoth and and i think there's there's two different emerald tablets there are what are called the emerald tablets which is i think the enuma elish and some of that yes that those cuneiform mm. tablets then there's also mm. another thing that yes. is called the emerald tablets of thoth and it was like it's mm. a book and it's it's we you know it's that's it's what one billy of those, carson that's that's one of those well no but he's, he's referencing an older thing that is the seven tablets of creation I think that's it. But there's he's also mm -hmm. referencing something that we're we we're we're using a translation of someone else. We don't have the original to go back to. Right. And so there's Yeah, I of... found some stuff that talked about <laughs> like in uh something from the Middle Ages that was supposed to be from a emerald tablet, but it's right. it's, it's it's a scroll series of scrolls and books and stuff. Um, mm -hmm. and you know, and, and it gets real confusing as to who's referring to what sometimes, um, yeah, mm -hmm. because that, that Emerald tablet, uh, you know, there's, there's art from 1606 talking about that. Um, and it's, it's, I, it's not, and, and the Emerald and tablet of Hermes, uh, Tris Magistus. Just, Tris yeah, Magistus. That one. Well, yeah. Yeah. And that's the one, that's the one that's interesting. So what I, what I was going to say is right. what I find interesting about it is that, you look at these two things, you go back to the oldest writing we've got and you can look at it and read it and the stories are there and you look at this other one and it's some of it's there and some of it's not. And so there's a bit of that where you have to look at it and go like, OK, like mm. we don't this isn't the original, but even and that's the crazy thing, though, like even those Sumerian tablets that we have, well, they're not the originals either. So mm -hmm. like, you yeah, know, I mean, let's go back to Babylonian. And, yeah, and they go back it. even deeper. Uh, and then Tho, who's also <laughs> Hermes Trismegistus, yeah. um, who we also know is also Jehudi from Africa. Uh, Veracruch or, or Veraculture, Quizacoto, which is from the Mesoamerica yeah. time. So, Quetz so this guy, Quetzalcoatl. Quetzalcoatl, there you go. Yeah. So he's he's 
come through and been through right. different and that's parts that, of history, which that's is interesting. That same, that's that that idea, and that's that's the thing. Like that's what's interesting, when you, right? When you really start to get to it, and you and mm-hmm. you look at these old stories, and you go, okay, well, I'm going to look in North America, South America, Europe, mm-hmm. Asia, and Africa, and they all have. I mean, they've all got different stories, but there's still like five or six of them that everybody's got. You know, there's the flood, there's the seven people who come down and, and pass on information, I mean, and it just repeats over and over and over again. And and it's it's one of two things: either everybody had the same thing happen to them, or the story that they're telling is so old that it that it spread over hundreds of thousands of years all the way across the world and we held on to it that long almost so a like, genetic memory I, story i think i think that this goes back all the way to the anunnaki and then having the ability to just raise vibration through sound these super advanced people and i've said this that were around that developed the spiritual technology um and created all of these pyramids who we now know have so much math deciphered and built into them which i wanted to hopefully get into maybe now another podcast and really talk about all of the musical octaves all 12 that are built in every single geometric pyramid in the great pyramid of the the, the giza with the five there it talks about in geometric form the base to the height is equal to all of the octaves uh, you have so you have the third and the sixth, you have the first and the second, uh, and then you have the first and the, and, and the eighth, and, and you basically all have all twelve, and they all, um, when you do the math on that, they all equal the same exact. Uh, from what I understand, the uh, the x uh, so the horizontal axis and the vertical axis, if, which is x plus y, right? And you take the base. So if you take the difference of that, which is y minus x, uh, which is the h- height, which is right. basically the square root of the product every single time, which is x times y. Uh, so what are we this measuring is every here single... to get 12 different things? So if you take all five pyramids right now, and this is oh, currently oh, all the different being... pyramids. I got you. I got you. I got you're you. going to see you, they're actually deciphering that there's all 12 octaves and they're all equally exactly to the, to the square root of the product every single time. And we're also seeing that like, we'll, we'll take the uh, pyramids in Mesoamerica. Um, the great pyramid is the exact half of the height uh, and the base to the uh, pyramid uh, the, in uh, Mesoamerica, which is the Tichunica. Uh, no, the... Uh, so we know that everything is proportioned and designed exactly to the specific down to the centimeter. I yeah, mean, the, it's, it, it's beyond incredible. So, so let's talk about this for a second. Cause I've, I've talked to <clears throat> Bill's ear off about this for forever. Have you checked out any of the uncharted X stuff about the, the, the scan vase project? Have I sent you any of that stuff? No. Okay. So let me, let me, yes. let me crash course this really that, quick. Yeah. Give me. So Ben Van Kirkwick, he's been on Rogan twice now. Yes. I think. Oh, I, I love him. Okay. He's great. So he talked yeah, about Ben's it on the, on the first, his first time on there about those vases that they were scanning. Oh yes. 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 Okay. This is maybe three years ago, four years he, ago. By, no, this is, this he has is a ben, crazy hat. He wears the crazy you, no, the cool hat. No, 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 not not the mushroom Grossel. hat guy. No, no, no. Okay. That's not Ben Different Grossel. Dude. Okay, okay. Not Ben okay. Grossel. No, Ben Van Kirkwick. Okay. okay. So he mm-hmm. he he he. They found these. There's pots. There's hundreds. There's thousands oh. of these pots oh. all over Egypt that they've found that are made I out did of see stone. That. Okay. Yes, and they have those beautiful engravings on them. Some of them have engravings on them. A lot of them are are smooth. So they found a lot of these pots. They there are some of them have, that have, were, were found in graves that are you know upwards of twelve to fifteen thousand years old. But they also found a significant number of them underneath Djoser's pyramid in in Egypt from the Old Kingdom, and so they're scattered all around. And they found a lot of these. And so they were able. He, he's been looking at them and saying there's a level of perfection to these. That is unexplainable with the tools that the Egyptians in that of that time should have had. This they shouldn't have been able to do this. 
And so through the process of him talking about that, a benefactor who had some dough was like, dude, I got one. Like I bought one. Let's scan it and see what's going on. And so mm-hmm. he's been working with metrologists over the last year. And, the, and so basically what it comes down to is these things are perfect to the level of unexplainable for us. So they, they measured this with structured light scanning. And so like the top is perfectly flat. The inside is perfectly 90 degrees. The circles are perfect. And then when you break it down, it can break down by a math equation, how all the circles work out. And I mean, it's bananas to the level that these metrologists are like, like this was keeping me up at night. Like, I don't understand how this works. And so then it got sent off to a cryptographer, got his hands Mm -hmm. on all of this information and he broke down the circle of life is in there. You can pull square roots and pi and, and the, and, um, uh, the the golden ratio um, oh, yeah. all pulls out of this, and if he goes, if you know, you can the find the formula. There's a that one one measurement of the divide of the piece will be essentially one, and then every every other measurement will be a fraction of some kind from that. I mean, it's bananas, and so now they've scanned you know multiples of these. Not all of them are made to this level of perfection, but the the point that they were getting at was you. You only do something to this level of perfection because you need to. And so they compare it to an engine. Like the pistons are manufactured to very tight tolerances, but other pieces like that nah, doesn't really matter. Like it doesn't need to be exactly perfect, but this piece does. And so they're looking at it going, maybe these weren't vases. Maybe the reason all of our vases look like this shape is because this exactly. is the first exactly. vase and, and we just were like exactly. well this shape obviously because yeah. they're all shaped no. like this but maybe these were and i and then you go crazy and you're like all right yeah, yeah, these yeah. like capacitors that were attached to something that yeah. could gather I mean, vibration i mean it gets yeah 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 yeah, yeah. It, it, it can get yeah certainly so so certainly. where i was going with that is that that level of perfection when you look at that if you're Sort of the way I, I kind of work backwards into the, some of these things where it's like, okay, I'm willing to accept these pots that I can see are to this level of perfection, which means it could be done. It can be done. Okay. So that means that all of that perfection that we see in the pyramid is also all intentional, was built that way on purpose. So then when you, go, when you take Absolutely. a step back and go like, well, now we're starting to see that these pyramids all have octave math right. in them. And we now know that there's more. You just have to go like, well, I guess – I guess that's plausible too. Then, like and, the, you that, know, that... I I wonder what we may eventually find when we look at some of the sites in in Mexico, especially in and around the Yucatan, because I've gotten a chance to visit a couple of the big famous ones, but I've also gotten to to visit the Coba site, which is the, oh, nice. the height right. of the the tallest point in the Yucatan because it's a pyramid, right? Mm-hmm. And it's you know it's it's one of the more recently discovered ones, and the thing you have to understand about the Yucatan is it's flat. Like there's, there's no mountains, there's no hills, there's no nothing. And so you can actually climb to the top of the pyramid, the tall pyramid, and you mm-hmm. look around and for what looks like miles, you see hills everywhere covered in jungle. And then you stop and realize every damn one of those is a pyramid as far as I can see for 360 mm-hmm. degrees. And it's just this massive complex, uh, you know, city, and we have no idea how big it really is. Well, and I mean, think, and so think of, but we don't we don't know all the layout. We don't know how it all ties in together right now because it's they just thought they were hills, you know. I mean, and now they're finding out that it's mm-hmm. this massive city complex, and it was it's also a major trade center. And again, like there was reports of this from the conquistadors and stuff and everybody's like, ah, I don't know what the hell they were talking about. And so they just blew it off because the city was devastated and reclaimed by the jungle, you know, which, um, which are finding a lot of these ancient places that we're now unraveling were initially or intentionally hidden by having them buried, covered up. Well, um, which those two pyramids, so we're finding a lot of this stuff. Was, well, was for whatever yeah. reason. Well, yeah, Tepe hidden. and Karahan Tepe at this yeah, point. There you go. Another I mean, that's, so here's that's a little thing. different than They're... the Amazon jungle stuff because that's that's all mostly naturally reclaimed. Because yes. the yes. jungle eats well, stuff. I mean, it just it dies. does. 
Yeah. Well, here was the other thing I was going to say when you said that is I, I if you think about if we take into account younger Dryas impact theory and the you know um, um, Randall's flood blood theory, which I mean I, it's hard to argue with. Well, maybe that's why everything is Central America and down. Mm-hmm. It just all uh, that. What oh, if all that stuff? But it's is, not. Is or there's, around, around there's, roughly the thirty third degree plane. I know that things have been shifted over the course yeah, of thousands and millions. But, there, but there the thirty third degree plane explains a lot. Yeah. There's so much left over, and a lot of it's been plowed down, unfortunately. But there's the snake mounds. There's other mounds. There's yeah, dirt pyramids and all that. I think it's easier to find those because there was Arca. more. Well, uh, what I was going to say is in Central America there was easier to carve rock. And up here, they were having to work with more dirt things and things like that and stuff mm-hmm. that the farmers didn't care. So let's plow over the damn thing, right? Well, I think you know that's that's I was I was reading the, started reading the book uh, Giants on Record, which is which is really yeah. fascinating. It's just a collection of like just people's news, it's just news reports and mm-hmm. and people's books and stuff. And you know, the first half, the first chapter of that book is just like. Here's the thing out of Columbus where he talks about giants, and here's Cortez talking about giants, and here's this guy. You're just like, oh, it's like Lewis and Clark talk about giants, mm-hmm. and you're going, okay, well, maybe, <laughs> all right, maybe there's some credence to this. But I think, I think the reason, sort of what we're seeing in the Amazon of them cutting down the trees and us losing that, North America did that already in the 1800s. Mm-hmm. As the settlers came through, we just – just knock down whatever was in the way. Whatever we needed to. Who knows what we lost in, in that oh, in that yeah. time frame. And we're still doing it. And, and what yeah. I mean oh, yeah. by that is, like, let's just take Texas, for example. Texas has two naturally formed lakes, one of which was formed by a natu- natural log jam, right? But we have hundreds of lakes in the state. How did we make the lakes? Well, the Corps of Engineers came in and went, we want to make a lake. So we're going to dam up the river and flood the damn valley. And there goes all those homesteads and stuff. So I mean, we're still we're still well, they, doing. I mean, this. they did that in Egypt when they dammed yeah. up the mile, the Nile. They cut, yeah, they they, sunk they, one of the cities, one well, of the, the major ancient cities. cities. Out there. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. And it's just fascinating because we've got we've had a couple of droughts in the last decade, and the stuff lakes have gone way up. down. And you know, it's like oh, ghost town. All of a sudden, we're right there under the lake where you went fishing. You had no idea it was there. So it's just it's yeah. it's not like we're not still just being like, eh, we'll flood this. Right. Yeah. And, and and I was watching Graham Hancock, I think it was on Joe Rogan, talking about there needs to be a better process for discovering or preserving, uh, you know, fossils or d- discoveries, you know, as far as the Western Front. I think someone touched on that, the, the movement mm-hmm. in the last 200 years going West, all the stuff is really just discovered off of construction, off highways. Mm-hmm buildings and And it's just taking someone quickly to go do that and there's there needs to be a better process there's also a real interesting wrinkle at least in the united states uh when we hit archaeology and we we talked a little bit about this with the the director of the Mm -hmm. galt site Mm -hmm. because he was like the best thing we could do is find human remains we're like well what would happen he's like well it depends on what the native tribes decide to do and Mm. we might not be able to do a damn thing I mean, that's not how he said it, but that's what it boiled down to. Is mm-hmm. yeah. if they go, no, we're going to rebury it. All science stops. All mm-hmm. science stops, and it doesn't matter if it's a hundred thousand years old or five thousand years old or three thousand. We'll never know. And again, uh, it's hard to argue mm-hmm. with that, right? Because yeah, that- we exterminated a lot of Native Americans, right? It was a massive genocide. So, and we destroyed their cultures and. And I don't know my own family culture from that because it's been so lost and muddled and mixed up. But I, I also think there's something to be <sighs> said for not we're, – we're inten- we're, we are deciding that because of this horrible thing that happened, mm-hmm. we're just never going to talk about the past ever, essentially. Well, and, it doesn't and matter. What it, if, you know, yeah, just, because we, it, what it boils down to is you're going to respect our origin story, so we're not going to let you do science because you committed atrocities on us before and, you know, destroyed our our uh, burial grounds and have come in and bulldozed them down and made farms out of them and turned them turned our, our ancestors' mm-hmm. bones and ground them up into compost. And, you know, so it's – there's a, a, a balance there, and 
we've got a lot. I'm not saying we shouldn't ever do the work. I think we should do the science, but there's a lot of faith rebuilding that needs to be done and trust building that needs to be done. Otherwise, you know, I, I mean, think, it's, I think it's a the messy problem, situation. The problem that you, I, I would expect that you would run into is first off, I doesn't, I, I don't know how people are picking sites. So like you'd have to have yeah. some sort of thing, but even if someone was like, I think there's something here I should go look for. If you find a body and then like, is there a process to go in ahead of time? Hey, I want to dig down, but I'm going to go below this time. Frame. Like there needs to be some process. Cause, but again, what I was going to say is yeah. like, because you go back Dan to Hancock the was talking about. Yeah. Yeah. There's there. And I think I listened to that same one. It was his last yeah, one. But yeah. like the, you look he was at, just on. at what, at what yeah. we find, you know, the Sarudi Mastodon is the one that I keep going back to because mm-hmm. it's 130,000 years old. Do you know that one, OJ? The gotcha. Sarudi no, Mastodon? No, 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 no. I'm, it's in fact, fascinating. I was just looking it up. So they, they found it in California. They were digging a highway. Oh. Um, and essentially what they found was a Mastodon. I think that's right. It had been that. It had been taken down. And the femur had been removed and taken away. So there was no femur bone. Um, they found a bunch of other bones that had been cracked open and the, the marrow had been taken out. And then the big thing that they found was that one of the tusks, so that it was laying on its side and one mm-hmm. of the tusks had been stuck this way. Like someone had taken it off and like stuck it in the ground like a flag. Right. Okay. Um, and so that was their evidence of, of, to human say, hey, activity. We marked some, her. Yeah. Well, no, no, but they they find this and they go, okay, this is evidence that that something, probably humans, but something mm-hmm. was something. was on North America, hunting mastodons and processing the bodies. That's a significant thing, and apparently Graham talks about this, but apparently they, it was rebutted by some people who looked at some pictures and said, nah, this isn't what it is, and no one ever actually went and looked at the site, and and you know, but oh, all right. I understand there might have been some type of ritual or gathering at the time of, of, of that, and and, and 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 that's so true. And and I think because of that, they they deemed it that, that it wasn't an actual complete, um, because it wasn't perfectly intact and it was like moved. They might have. Well, been there's there's also arguments a, of like, well, that was the heavy machinery that did that when we dug yeah, it up. Yeah, the bones right. weren't you know, really cracked. Yeah. It was the machine. It was a, it was a tool work. So, it was a, it was the backhoe, and it's like eh, a lot of that. Yeah, it matches exactly. the stone. It matches the stone tools, not a backhoe. You know, um, mm-hmm. and then you know, just to kind of give an example of the stuff I was talking about, I just you know looked it up. The the oldest human remains we have right now in North America are from the Arlington Springs man which was discovered in 1959 before a lot of these Native American um, – oh, what do we call it when we give something back to somebody? Um, Reparation. Rep- er, not that, but anyway, um, <clears throat> returning of the stuff to the Native Americans was pound, found, so they were able to do radiocarbon dating and some of that. And you know, they're 13,000 years old. That's from 1959. That's older than the Clovis first day. That's older than the 10,000 10, year layer anyway. And that's just the oldest one we've found. Yeah. Which which really strikes one of the well, biggest problems with archaeology for me. And I saw this, I don't remember where I saw it the other day, but I was watching some show and they were talking about it and he goes, well, we know it's not there because we haven't found it. And I'm like, yet. You left off the yet. <laughs> we haven't found it yet. Every time we yeah. find it, it breaks yeah. your paradigm. And I keep right, having that right, argument right. about dinosaurs so. and dragons, man. Like, well, dragons yeah, we aren't real. Will. We haven't found one yet. Like, yet. give it time. Oh, yet. The and again, not, this, and this doesn't mean all the it's, good work the archaeologists are doing is bad. I mean, we, we got a ton of information from the director of the Galt site. It's, it's really good work that's being done. But, you know, and, and it's just that because we even got into that a little bit, you know, people get tied mm-hmm. up into their ego and their ideas and, and this and that, yeah. Can, yeah. that can just – destroy careers and we talked about some people whose careers were destroyed because they found stuff that didn't match the stuff that was being published at the time and it took years and years and years of continual evidence to whittle away at this to change the gestalt idea of what actually happened you can also have the opposite happen because you mentioned the the anunnaki earlier and i was going to mention that like the anunnaki kind of got messed up with when Sitchin wrote his stuff, Mm -hmm. you know, he wrote these books and 
you know, some of the stuff he said was might maybe right, and and some of it was clearly mistranslated as they look back at it, and and you know, have, some people have looked at it again. But like, you know, he he went out on a limb. He was wrong, and then it just sort of broke the the, the whole and, thing shifted. And now, if you talk about it, and, you're and it also you know, doesn't help that then he decided to use it to write some books of fiction to push some other right. ideas. And people aren't mm. sure. They're like, well, what did he, was that the fiction book? Was that the real book? Or it gets muddled the same way that, you know, people, if you're, if you're like, well, I read chariots of the gods, like you read that book. It's like, yeah, have you actually read it? Well, no, but I know they're kooky. It's like, do you know that he's just constantly asking questions about lots of weird stuff? That's all the book is. He yeah. doesn't put any conclusions yeah. forward in the book. Um, yeah. Yeah. What I was going to say is that, that though, when what's interesting though, is that when I actually went back and started to read some of that old stuff and you're like, Oh, well, he wasn't just like making up the Anunnaki, like it's legitimately in here. And when you read some of that stuff, it, it's really interesting coming from a religious background and and knowing some of that, you know, that Genesis story and a lot of that early stuff that, you read these these old stories and you go, oh, well, that's Adam and Eve and that's Noah and that's Moses. And that's like a lot of these archetypes are in there. And correct. Yeah. The, the stuff that didn't make it into the Bible is the weird stuff when it's like the Anunnaki came down and there were people there were there were already some people here. And then they were like, we're tired of working. And like, All right. Well, we'll make the monkeys into people to work for us. Like it didn't right. say monkeys, but like, you right. know, so- it, and, and here's something else I want to throw out here because I don't know if y'all have ever looked into it because I have a background in ancient languages and that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. <laughs> of what we have in the British mm-hmm. Museum alone, only ten oh, percent of the cuneiform tablets have even been cataloged, much less translated. They just made a tool. There but is only ten percent a- of them are like. No, I know. Scanned in and but, looked at. They've still got 90% of what they've got there that is sitting in boxes. But now, we don't now even know they've got there. a tool that they can mm-hmm. take the picture of a cuneiform tablet and drop it into the system, and the AI can read it and translate it almost instantaneously. Yeah. So yeah, we're on the edge the tool. of – Yeah, that's the same tool referring to yeah, the tra- right. trans- yeah. But Okay, and I have issue with that. Not because it's – just because I have issue with AI in yeah, general. Yeah. There is so much nuance to translating mm-hmm. language, especially an ancient dead language, into a more modern one that I would be very hesitant to just trust that as gospel, for lack of a better way to put it. Um, it takes collaboration. It takes examination. It takes argument. It takes discussion to kind of figure out what it actually well, he, means. Here's- Here's the interesting thing, though, about that. that. There, there aren't that many people who actually know how to read cuneiform. Fair enough. Absolutely like, so, fair enough. So when you're talking about, like, let's argue over the Hebrew to, you know, Greek translation of the Bible, there are mm-hmm. potentially Lots tens of, people, of thousands yeah. of people who could have that argument. When you're arguing about the translation of a cuneiform tablet, there's like nine guys, mm-hmm. you know. and and No, no, I get that. You know, I get that. And a lot of – so mm-hmm. – so, there is a bit of that, but I think the other piece of it is cuneiform. I I also do, my understanding of it from the book I read that that got one of the guys I got one of those nineteen you know eighteen seventy four books of some guy who did some of the early translations and and he sort of breaks it down and and it's apparently once you figure it out it's really not that hard like apparently the 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 symbols and the mm-hmm. figures and the way it's broken down is very. It's not like English where it's all janky. It's like mm-hmm. this does this and it does it this way every time and it always works this way. And, and, and <laughs> well, and, you know, and th- this also leads to one of the problems um, <laughs> potentially is, again, we haven't cataloged a lot of this stuff. And unless there are For different saying, versions, yeah, uh, th- unless there are different versions of the same text, it becomes a lot. Well, we only have one primary source, right? That uh, that's the thing, though. Uh, with a lot of no. these, a lot of these things, though, like, they're one off. They're, they're, they're yeah, they're not actually. Oh, okay. They're like with the Enuma Elish and stuff like that. There are like 
15 so, and they're all broken and, and the in question is, places and they're able right. to do they all together. match you know that's the question is do yes. they all match yeah, and, yeah, and, yeah, 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 yeah. if they, if they don't all... because that's where we get into the biblical stuff right because yeah, we're writing on paper or, or scrolls and things like that and yes. you're you know um, it, it wasn't it wasn't carbon the... copies you know and that, no, it that has led to it... con... and that yeah. and you can say that but I think I think part of the thing about that though is all of the arguments that you're making and valid, totally valid. Oh, yeah. Like why we should question this. Every single one of them applies to every single religious text we have. Oh, absolutely. And historical. Yes. yes. Ab- and and historical. Moves, absolutely. And, and moves the needle away from a dogma state of mind versus. Yeah. yeah I just, and, and it's if again, anything, I think we more should of use gospel, the AI. You know. uh, yeah. I was going to say, I think we yeah. should use the AI tool. It's a great place to start. But we also need that academic research to go in and compare and make right. sure and follow right. up and, and do all that, right? And this and is not also just, coming just out be of like, MIT. oh, we know what it is now, right? That's This yeah, is also coming part. out of MIT after mm-hmm. – and I also don't think it's yeah. just AI. I think this is – it's not AI. It's machine learning. Like it's mm-hmm. it's it's different. It's not – It's, it, not it's an important GPT tool. Doing, yeah. It's not chat GPT. This is a – this is a tool that a work of it work a group of MIT scientists have spent the last 15 years developing. Like this oh, is not well, like a, yeah. this is not a quick flash in the pan AI. Hey, if we can translate CUNY, and, form, this is, this is a little different. Yeah. It's, it, and again, it's just the hesitancy mm-hmm. because I have seen what misinterpretation can do, what mistranslation can do, the arguments it can cause, the wars it can start, right? Well, I mean, How many and, people and have died or something like that. So we got to be careful about it. That's, but That's what's interesting is from. if if you look at the if you look at the stories that are in the Bible as truly the ancient stories that we have, and we go back and look at the the Babylonian and Sumerian tablets that we've got, it's the same story. For I mean, mm-hmm. bits and pieces of it are different. It's Obviously, it's been pretty three thousand years. Pretty spot on. Yeah. But it's uh, it's the same story. And what's interesting is that if you start looking at the Bible, going like. Again, it's what I said before. It's look at what they left out. Mm-hmm. You know, there's a lot of that, you know, because I remember, I think the first Gospel time I heard. The Holy 12, Book of Enoch, et cetera. It, it's, no, no, not, not even that. Like, like in just in Genesis alone, it's effect like Noah Genesis. is the Cliff Notes version of Noah, right? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> some of the creation story yeah. stuff is the Cliff Notes version of the creation story. From the you know the cuneiform and the Babylonian and the Mesopotamian and stuff, it's like those are more fleshed out versions of the story. We've got mm-hmm. these shorthand ones. Um, but what for I whatever find, reason, what I find so interesting though is that just because of the way it is, the Bible stories are the ones that are right, and the older ones must not be right. And it's like, well, actually, I think the older ones are more right. Which like actually it, goes against bit of biblical literalism and, and, right, and which analysis is, which and stuff because so, you look for the older. Right. Yeah. Because <clears throat> obvi- if, if we can look at the stories as they move through time, because we can, we can track them as mm-hmm. they move and shift and change. Right. The book I read that book, um, um, Zealot by Reza Aslam, where he talks about the, the, the man who is Jesus and he explains like – why the birth story of Jesus changes four times. Cause he's like, well, when they wrote it this time, this is what was important. And then 10 years later, when they wrote it again, this thing was more important than this mm-hmm. thing. So that's why it changes here. And, and so mm-hmm. if you can just do that within the birth of Jesus story, imagine what happens over 5,000, 10,000 years as this story shifts from whatever it was before the younger dryas to whatever it becomes after. And then what was it for the what eleven no four thousand years before people started writing something down? Mm-hmm. Like and you, you know, there's a really good modern example of that. If you just want to look at it, we can go. All right, so we have the 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 Mesopotamian flood story about Noah. <clears throat> then we have the the um, let's call it the the Middle Ages Latin story of Noah. And then we have today's modern children's Bible in English talking about Noah, and it's like smaller, right. smaller, smaller, right? Dumbing it down, dumbing it down, making it easier to understand. So th- these stories change, and you know, 
And why did we make it simple in the children's story? To make it easier for kids to understand and learn and do. And then you go and read the, the older stuff. So uh, these stories change over but time. I, they do change <laughs> over time. But it, it's interesting that it – like since we're talking about Noah, that it goes from a guidebook on how to survive the apocalypse. Mm-hmm. Like, here's the boat you need to build. Here's how you need to put it together. Here's the pitch you need to put on it. Here's the supplies you need to put in your boat. Here's the animals that you need to take. Here are the people that need to come with you. You need to make sure you put a really strong roof on this thing. Like, it is is a Mm -hmm. a a DIY guidebook on how to survive this thing. And what we've (laughs) turned it into is two of every animal on a big boat. And, like, I feel like we – in the – in the the societal push for us to to push aside catastrophism, we had to remove the catastrophe from Noah. Because one of the biggest things that I remember, and I don't remember which cuneiform tablet I was reading, but it was right. the, it, the the thing that it mentioned in the Noah flood was the bodies were on the water like reeds of grass, and it so, clicked immediately that I went, "Oh my God!" The Bible story of the Noah when he lets out the dove, the the it would have just been bodies everywhere. Just so I just thought every, of this. If everybody died, like this <clears> is crazy. You were talking, you mentioned earlier in the gospel about the Jesus stories, how they, they wrote it for a different meaning mm-hmm. on each thing. Well, when you're thinking about the, the Hebrew Noah story at the mm-hmm. time, it would have been being written down and told it was a people starting over. It was a people leaving enslavement, fleeing Egypt, taking over new land, right. killing lots of people to take their land, um, absorbing other cultures. It was a rebirth story. So the Noah story is a rebirth story, not a surviving the apocalypse story, because that's not what we need. We need a new beginnings story. Right. So, you know, they rewrote the existing right. story everybody knew in a framework to help move their society where they needed to go, potentially, right? I'm just talking right. my ass here, but well, um, it, it holds up. Yeah, it it gets interesting when you start to break it down. It's actually sitting right there. Um, yeah. The no, that's actually not. That's a different one. That's the the secret history of the world. Mm. I tried to get Bill to read, and he was like, "I can't read this." Like, thing. It's just too crazy. Um, for it's me. it's really interesting. He he sort of opens the book with like, okay. Let's just set every set all our logic aside for a minute here, and let's look at these stories as what they are and see if we can put these into some sort of narrative. And that mm-hmm. was sort of the first thing that cracked my brain open because it, it goes like four chapters explaining like all the Greek – the, the Greek stories that we have of the gods and the demigods, and, and that sort yeah. of all fits in. And then it's like – and then and like fits. chapter – then chapter five Lomic, goes, and I then – and then the flood happens. Then, then the then the catastrophe happens. And I was like, "Oh!" And it clicked. And I went, "Oh, everything's all that, all those myths that we have, those heroes and legends, are before the cataclysm." And that's and even like biblical, Atlantis, you know. When you look at that, cities, you know, they were buried <laughs> before the flood. They talk about in 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 Genesis, you know, and there were heroes in those days, and mm-hmm. and hero didn't mean what we think of as hero. It meant someone who was capable of doing heroic acts, good or right. bad. Right? That was a resurrections. Well, or you know, ripping people's heads off and killing them all. That was a heroic act because it wasn't something the average person could do, or that killing too. thousands yeah. of men or whatever. They weren't. You know, we think of heroes, we think Superman, Batman, Captain America, and all that. That's that's not what hero means. And this is why translation is such a big thing for me, because we have modern connotations for verbiage. And we, we're seeing mm-hmm. that change now. I mean, let's look at one of Daniel's favorite words for me and I, or for us to talk about, mm-hmm. gay. The history yeah. of gay, that phrase in yeah. English. It is not what it – it was not what it means today, right? It has changed over time. Daniel, where did that come right. from again, Daniel? I'm, I'm blanking. I don't remember. It uh, used to mean happy. Yeah, it's it's it used to mean happy, but it was happy. like – It means like something the else. Etymology. It to, yeah. yeah. No, it's the other one. It's the one that starts with uh. the letter F that we don't talk about that – that used to mean a bundle of sticks, and then it turned uh, into a different thing. Well, it also means cigarettes um, in, in England. Right, so. in England, yeah. So, yeah, which is where it meant carefree, cheerful, yeah. or gay, gay was cheer, carefree, cheerful, or bright and shiny. 
you know it's uh, in um it's in the song good morning from singing in the rain they they say yeah. happy and gay in that song that's yeah. what yeah. It, so that's what it the, meant the, the word gay arrived in english during the 12th century from old french guy which is g a i most likely diver, der, uh, deriving ultimately from a german source uh, meaning joyful, carefree, bright and showy, and the word was very commonly there is another used, term. and so on and so on. But so hey, language changes over time, and it so does. Yeah, it that's does. why and when that's we see something same, written and right. translated, it's so important to understand the context of where that's coming from, and so many people don't, because it takes a lot of work. Let's be honest. How much time do we have to do all the research for a lot of people? A lot of people don't. Um, but the danger of all this and getting in all these theories and all this stuff, and I want to loop back to that, is you can end up with someone like my aunt, my, my dad's sister, who will say things mm-hmm. like, well, the King James Version of the Bible was good enough for Jesus, so it's good enough for me. And it's word for word what it was when he was here. I'm like, there wasn't no such thing as English back then. you know. So that's what well, you've got to be careful let's just, of. Let's just step away from the fact that, like, the book that has stories about the guy mm-hmm. was written when the guy was alive. Like, let's just, let's just yeah, set no, levels out there. Yeah, I know it's, it's a, yeah. it, it, <laughs> but that's, that's a mindset that people will fall into because it's dogmatic. Yes. And I think that's the danger. And you right. mentioned that earlier, um, you know, dogma and that kind of stuff can be, it can Dog, be a trap yeah. for, for anybody mm-hmm. to fall into. And, uh, that's why I think it's so important to like trust the instincts like we talked about at the beginning of this guy feels like a used car salesman. So I want to triple check all the resources or re- all my right. resources to well, see where it comes so, from. And I've been continuing to do the same thing. And so, you know, go ahead, go ahead. no, but, you know, Robert Edward Grant lately, mm-hmm. I mean, if you haven't seen some of the work he's put out recently. I mean, he's really put on uh, some great stuff out there. It, it's really blown my mind. And he's taken the time to meet with a lot of high-end, uh, you know, uh, whether it's uh, adversaries or just, you know, just kings, uh, presidents, just uh, lots of people, and just understanding that there's this uh, new technology uh with with uh, frequencies, I think he was out in Dallas just testing a new technology where you're able to d- to charge your phone uh, with just being in a like a vicinity of like a half a mile up there in Dallas with this like mm. Tesla component. So just yeah. all this technology, and, and he's all tying it. And I say all that because he's all tying it back in to the same technology that's being deciphered in the pyramids. And uh, yeah. I know we didn't get a chance to talk to it much uh, right now, but it, it, it's, it's basically understanding fractals down fundamentally. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, just a lot of cool stuff in there. Um, but yeah, have you, you off. No, no, um, you're good. Have you and, seen uh, the stuff about the new mm-hmm. plasmoid engines? Have you been following oh, this looks at all? Fascinating. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, so, so hey, Toyota I, 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 is so, working on it. Oh, I don't know about that. That may be I thought, the case. I thought Toyota was working on it. Go ahead. Go pull ahead. that Sorry. up and check on that. Maybe a new thing. What I was going to say is, is uh, Randall Carlson was going to go on Rogan and talk about this. And oh, it yeah. Ended up happening. There was a whole thing. I won't get into it. It doesn't really matter. But he was on Danny Jones's podcast talking about it. And I did a little research on my own, watched a couple of videos. Uh, love Randall Apparently... Cross. And and what I find most interesting about this is they're like the the plans are on the internet. People are making these at home on their own. This isn't one oh. of those things where somebody's like, look at the machine that's magic, but you can't touch it or look at any of the pieces. This guy's like fiddle with it. I don't care. It works. Mm-hmm. Um, but apparently it is a plasmoid generator, which I don't fully grasp in any way whatsoever. I'm not smart enough to understand it. But it's something that there that that is an attachment. That they they attach to an ex, to an existing gas powered motor that pretty much makes its output clean. Oh, okay. It just removes almost all the carbon dioxide. It puts out oxygen so, heavy output. Like it's bananas. Zero carbon. Okay. Yeah. And so people were w- wow. at one point. Someone was talking about how someone got Ooh. down real close to the exhaust pipe and was like, "You can breathe this. It's not toxic. Like it's." Is so it like a uh, like it's like a generator of some sort that's just uh, it's, carbon it's, neutral. 
it's, it's something that attaches to an existing gas power. So you put gas in the tank and you turn mm. it on and then they huh. activate this piece that's part of it. And it mm -hmm. pushes, I essentially, I think it's pushing plasma wow. into the engine. I, I don't fully grasp oh. it, but it's adding something think, to the existing engine that makes it clean when it comes out. Were they showing the a thing. video out there yeah. in England? Was he out in England? Sh Right out, out there, you were showing, and there was like a bigger machine that it was attached to. And, yes. And, and okay, and, and and you could see the bubbles at the, at the it, yeah. Like, there's a little oh, bubbler yeah, thing. Yeah, there's a little bubbler. Yeah, 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 yeah. totally. That's what I was so, impressed. Okay, here's, okay, yeah. I saw a little bit of it. Here's so, yeah, what I is Toyota doing a thing. Yeah. So here's what okay, I found yeah, with I Toyota. That. That's not they're not doing the engine yet. Mm -hmm. At least not what I've been able to find. But this is what I remember finding about it. They have. Uh, put transient plasma ignition systems, just the ignition system, into their uh, 2.5 liter um, direct fuel injection engine, and they're finding significant fuel efficiency increases oh. and decreased emissions just from the ignition system. And yeah. uh, you know, mm. it, 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 so this is and this is on a lot of the green energy website. So Toyota is looking at it, right? Um, okay. And I remember seeing like they were they were interested in some of the other stuff too because they're always experimenting whether they bring it to production right. or not, right? Kind of like so I right. other I tech companies plasma, they will go ahead. I just threw plasmoid engine into Google just to, and check click news just to see what would come up. And a lot of them are talking about other stuff, but they're it's interesting. They've mentioned a couple of them about they're looking at fusion plasmoid space propulsion. That they're going to be able to use this in in space somehow. Fascinating. But but Fascinating. They were, one of the things that Randall mentions is that there's uh, maybe it wasn't Randall, it was a different podcast. But they were talking about how you know there's all these copper tubes and things that move around, and and apparently the the guy who built this machine did worked in conjunction with Car Randall Carlson because there's apparently. Mm -hmm. you know, sacred geometry in this thing and that one of these angles has to be 51 degrees or something it's the same angle as the pyramid that it just happens to be the same pyramid that if you change that angle the whole thing doesn't work if you fix it back it works perfectly like so there it's, you know we look at you look at that you look at i don't know if you i've been thinking i which, mentioned to you there's a there's a thing called bam builders of the ancient oh uh, gosh megalith so hard maybe. to get through Build, Watch it, it's builders one. of ancient man or something like that or it's something like that yeah, yeah but it's to me there daniel yeah I'd love yeah to check it out I mean, so yeah fundamentally... that one, but they talk about all these different places and and what it the thing that i'm seeing moving through all of this whether it's the pottery or egypt or mesoamerica or those caves in india that have perfect curve is that like the math was wild like I found it. What'd you find? No, no, go ahead. I'll, I'm sorry. Okay. I, go ahead. The, the math was wild. The, the way that they were constructing things is at a level that we just don't understand. We don't put math. You know, when I make a, when I make a cup, you know, as perfect as this cup is, there's no, this, the diameter of this circle and the diameter of this circle don't make pie. So why does the vase do that? Like we don't, we're not we're not putting math into the structures in that in that way. You know, we use math to make sure the cup doesn't fall apart. But like we're not we're not building beauty into a into a structure in the way that they were. And like right, right. What was that mental process? You know what I mean? Like yeah. And yeah, we're finding a lot in uh uh the uh, like the Da Vinci uh, code, and, and, and I think you, you were talking about the uh, sacred ge geometry of the flower of life. Yeah. Um, but even if you go as high as like the third level of the flower of life, you start understanding that uh, with Da Vinci as well, uh, where the initially during the first layer of the flower of life, you see the uh, the square. Uh, bigger than the circle, and then right. as you get to the third level, you see the the square the, the circle bigger than the square, and what you call circling the square, right? And and so that's and, and we're starting to see that unravel in a lot of things. Uh, 
the 16th chapel has that outlined in one of the uh, paintings recently that they were talking about where it, it's it's fascinating like each dimension that we're unraveling you can see it in the 16th chapel one of the paintings so hmm. understand yeah yeah you should check that out i can send you the information on that um but yeah there's just yeah, a, lot that. Of, a lot so of really I, I found, interesting stuff they're finding at the vatican i yeah. found a couple of plasmoid things that just just i know we oh, go for shifted it. away so one yeah, of them good. is um the the Bindle engine, which that's uh, the guy, yeah, the, and that's the guy in Australia oh. who has invented something, and it mixes like water and a little bit of petroleum, and it basically is almost like a mini atomic generator, and it looks really interesting. It deals with implosion versus compression and things like that, which I don't, I don't have enough science to understand the science. That's the it. plasmoid thing. It does yeah, that's the plasmoid thing. thing. It creates these weird bubbles that it and, makes. And, and, I don't yeah, know and some some people were like, "Oh, this stuff's wild. That's stupid. Whatever, kooky guy." And then I also find an article from the Debrief, which is a really cool uh, news site, and they're talking about NASA stuff and all kinds of other mm -hmm. science stuff, and it's like, um. New plasma propulsion system generates a hell of a lot of thrust. Our solar system wow. just became a bit smaller due to the new plasma propulsion saw. concept yeah. developed by the U.S. Department of Energy, and it goes on to it. And then they talk wow. about plasmoid engines. And I'm like, mm -hmm. but that's what the other guy's talking about. But you're just yeah. talking about slapping it on a rocket. So, um, <laughs> you know, but so this stuff's actually happening. Now, whether which one's right or which one's wrong. Right, Plasma is an energy – it's a state of matter. It's not something we yeah, all understand. Fourth, all the, it's the yeah. fourth state. Yeah. Uh, it's so it's, it's there. We just it's, don't it's necessarily just, understand it all that this well. This feels like what it would have been like at the beginning of, like, flight. Mm -hmm. If people could communicate as big, as fast and as much as we could, where it's like, yeah. dude, there's mm -hmm. some dudes who are trying to fly. Those guys are morons. Like, and then you're like, actually, no, they, they did it. Did we it. Saw it. You're like, no, nah, yeah. screw you. It must be <laughs> fake. Like, you know, mm -hmm. so like, I wonder if that's the same sort of thing that like, but at, now you're sort of fighting against the corporate, you know, you got to actually, it seems like the gas the the natural not natural gas the the petroleum industry would be desperate for this technology because if they could come around and go like look we can not only make the cars cheaper we can do less you know we don't have to get all those minerals and stuff for the batteries you can still use the petroleum you have and all you got you can still mm -hmm. keep, keep the car you have mm -hmm. with a Six hundred dollar upgrade. There's now no more trans, no more well, emissions, but, and you but, don't. And, no more emissions. But, but with 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 the the narrative that we have right now in the religion of climate control, the answer to that is like you don't have to feel bad about driving your car anymore because your car no longer contributes to the global. I mean, like it seems like they should be begging for this thing, like because it would just it feels like it would shift the whole industry. Well, the problem is it would break so many things and destroy so many things. They don't want it, right? That's the, yeah. that's it's it's the it's the bad part of capitalism coming out. Or well, just what? let me rephrase uh, that. Let me rephrase that. It's the bad part of existing infrastructure coming out, and everybody's bought what? into a system that's already there, which is bad. I think I don't think the system has tipped far enough though. Like if if what we're talking about is the system of petroleum cars versus electric cars. Mm -hmm. If you could tomorrow or even five years from now put out a thing that turned every car with a catalytic converter into a a a car that, that has zero well, emissions. It, it, imagine if just this Toyota thing goes to work and instead of spark plugs, we put in plasmoid plugs and right. now you get triple your fuel efficiency. Right. Right. I mean that's it's, that's amazing. Or it's like the guy it's who like came, the guy who came came up with the hundred mile the, an hour or hundred mile per gallon carburetor back in the day and then they swooped in and just bought his patents and he went away. Well and that's you know, Tesla and I mean every other know. person who's had a great idea that has been taken from them by bought and someone shelved. With, or worse, the federal government comes in and goes, That it's a great idea, but it's a threat to our national security, so it's ours now. Can't talk yeah. about it. Which makes you wonder if that's why that dude is in Australia. Like, yeah. But, yeah. <laughs> or the guy from Houston who came up with the water-powered car, the water and power then car died. Died. 
during his meeting during with, the his gas meeting executives, with the gas executives. And he goes, I'm poisoned and fell over dead. That was exactly. a really cool one. All right. Well, let's go ahead and stop it let's here. I think that's a good, here. I think that's a good, yeah. a good place to stop. Yeah, my iPod. My-